everyone, and thank you all so much for joining today's webinar. We have an amazing lineup of speakers and um, really, uh, really great conversation that I'm looking forward to on an extremely important topic as we talk about biosafety uh, and biosecurity framework and oversight here in the United States. Let me take a moment to um, briefly introduce each of our panelists, and I'm only going to share a couple of top lines from their bio. If you'd like to read their entire bio, please feel free to go to the Belfer uh, Center website where you see their their um, their full bios. So I'm going to start by first introducing Dr. Rajiv uh, Venkaya. He is the CEO of Arium Therapeutics. He was previously special assistant to the president for biodefense at the White House, where he was a principal author of the National Strategy for Pandemic Influenza. Next, we have Dr. Angela Rasmussen. She is a virologist at the Vaccine and Infectious Disease Organization. Her research focuses on the role of the host in various uh, virus susceptibility and pathogenesis, pathogenesis with a particular interest in emerging viruses that are or have the potential to be major threats to global health, such as avian influenza virus, dengue, Ebola virus, mpox, MERS, and SARS. Next, we have um, Dr. Greg uh, Koblitz. He's an associate professor and director of the Biodefense Graduate Program at George Mason University. Um, his research and teaching focus on understanding the causes and consequences of the proliferation of nuclear, biological, chemical weapons to state and non-state actors, global virus risk management, and the impact of emerging technologies on international security. And lastly, we have Dr. Lawrence Kerr. He's a Deputy Vice President, Global Health and Multilateral Affairs at the Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers of America. Previous to his role, um, Dr. Kerr was a director uh, at Pandemic and Emerging Threats at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Office of Global Affairs, where he oversaw a policy portfolio, including the Global Health Security Agenda 2024 Policy Development and Implementation, Pandemic Influenza Preparedness, World Health, or World, World Health Organization R&D Blueprint Efforts on Emerging Threats, Countering Antimicrobial Resistance and Security Policy Issues, including Biosafety, biosecurity, bio threat prevention, and dual use research of concern. So we uh, first welcome uh, to our amazing uh, panelists uh, here today. So just a disclosure on my end, uh, my name is uh, Dr. Sarmadad for the audience that has joined, but uh, for today's conversation, please call me Syrah, and I'm going to call you all by your first name if that is okay, since many of us obviously know each other um, uh, quite, uh, quite well. So just for a full disclosure, uh, to get us started off, I am a member of the National Science Advisory Board for Biosecurity. However, uh, I am not representing NSADB in any shape or form in today's discussion. So this is certainly going to be obviously casual and just discussing obviously some really important topic as we talk about biosecurity and biosafety framework here in the United States. So what I'd love to do is, um, you know, obviously we're talking about advancements and challenges in biosafety and biosecurity oversight. And on September 1st, the White House Science and Technology Policy Office posted a request for information on the potential changes to the policies for oversight of dual use research of concern, uh, or DERC, and the potential uh, pandemic pathogen care and oversight P3CO policy framework. So I'd love to ask each of our panelists in your introductory remarks in a couple of minutes to share what your thoughts are on the United States P3CO and DERC policies. And if you can share a challenge that exists and how these frameworks can be strengthened. So uh, we'll, we'll start off with Rajiv and then uh, we'll go with Greg, Larry, and Angie. Thanks, Ira, and, and thanks for, for having us here today. Um, you know, I, I my perspective on this is informed by uh, my work in the time that I was in the White House uh, when the National Research Council report on biotechnology in an age of terrorism came out. That was the foundation of the creation of the National Science Advisory Board for Biosecurity, which you're a member of, and which has a really uh, an illustrious group of people in, in involved. And the NSABB, um, well, actually, before I talk about the current NSABB, let me just say that I went back and looked at the NRC report. Uh, and it's, it's remarkable to me that uh, that report highlighted seven categories of experiments of concern those seven categories have all held up extraordinarily well. There's just one uh, specific experiment that's been since identified, and that is the resurrection of an extinct or er eradicated uh, pathogen that has been added to the list. But otherwise, everything else has essentially stayed the same. And I think that that really highlights the, uh, the robustness of that work, 
but also the the underpinning principle that uh, biological agents are are very very difficult to uh, control or manage, or I should say, policy is difficult to to develop to to manage this risk. Just about everything highlighted then continues to be present today. What I will say is that U.S. government policy has come a long way. It's uh, it's it's great to see uh, what has been done by uh, OSTP and HHS and its component agencies. And I think the NSABB earlier this year came out with a, a very thoughtful set of recommendations on how the policies around P3CO and dual use research of concern can be brought together, integrated, um, and to address a few gaps. And in terms of the the, the gaps that I see in, in the, the current policies, I, I, I'll just acknowledge that there is no silver bullet for this problem. You need to have a series of imperfect uh, layers of protection, just like you do, by the way, for a pandemic virus, uh, in order to have an effect. And to me, what is um, most important in all of this is that there be an awareness amongst investigators, people that are doing research, of the potential misuse of the research that they're doing, and also an understanding that if they see something that is problematic, that they speak up and they they shine a light on it and that there be a discussion, that there be transparency around that. That to me um, could be highlighted further and more work could be done there. But uh, but I would say that the, the majority of issues that I think are necessary to address to me have, you know, we've made a very, very good start in, in, in all areas. So I'll stop there and happy to talk more about industry perspectives and others later. No, that was wonderful. I think it goes in hand in hand to talk about that culture of safety and transparency that needs to be built up within the institution um, as, as well. But thank you so much for those opening remarks, Rajiv. Um, I will go over to Greg for your opening remarks. Hi, Sarah. Thanks a lot. Um, I want to kind of take a step back and, and put these issues in a, in a broader context uh, because the global virus landscape has really become much more complicated and challenging uh, over the last several years due to several trends that are underway uh, before the pandemic, but really were uh, accelerating, exacerbated by, by COVID-19. Uh, these trends include the growth in maximum containment laboratories, the rise of preprint servers that allow the publication of potentially um, sensitive research without peer review, uh, the growing investment of the private sector in the life sciences, which the United States has little to no oversight over, uh, the growth in virus hunting, despite the lack of any national or international uh, guidance for field biosafety, uh, the growing number of experiments in the, the you know, the quote-unquote gain-of-function area that assesses the risk of um, zoonotic pathogens for jumping into humans, uh, developments in fields outside of microbiology and molecular biology that have um, dual-use implications, uh, the convergence of emerging technologies like AI uh, with biology that poses, again, kind of some new uh, biosafety and biosecurity risks, and the growth in disinformation. Um, and so kind of the combination of these, these trends has made this virus landscape much more complicated. Um, and just kind of zoom in on, on one of those trends that, that I've done quite a bit of work on um, lately, um, along with Felipe Lensos at King's College London, we run a, a project called the um, Global Biolabs Initiative, uh, which tracks maximum containment BSL-4 labs around the world. And right now we have um, 69 of these labs either in operation, under construction, or planned in 27 countries. Uh, and the U.S. Uh, has the, the largest number of these labs um, currently. Uh, since the pandemic, there's been a building boom in BSL-4 labs with another um, nine countries announcing plans to build 12 more labs, uh, mostly in, in Asia. And uh, to understand the implications of this for kind of the global biosecurity landscape, we also produced a virus management scorecard that measured the strength of biosafety, biosecurity, and dual use research oversight uh, in countries that either have or plan to have BSL-4 labs. And out of the 27 countries we looked at, uh, 21 scored high in biosafety governance, which is pretty good, uh, 12 scored high in biosecurity, and only one country scored high in dual-use research. Uh, and that was not the United States, that was Canada. Uh, in the United States, we lack national legislation and a dedicated agency for oversight of dual-use research. Uh, instead, we have a patchwork of policies for oversight of dual-use research that leaves large swaths of our research and life sciences unregulated, uh, and the existing policies are full of loopholes. Uh, unfortunately, right now, there are stronger regulations governing the use of lab animals in experiments than there are for conducting research with potential pandemic pathogens. Uh, I think the NSAB recommendations do go a long way to closing some of those gaps, uh, but I, I think at the end of the day, what's really needed to ensure the implementation of these 
policies in order to reduce the risks of um, uh, to biosafety, biosecurity uh, is a, a national virus management agency or office that has, you know, a, kind of a nationwide purview and is able to um, regulate this research regardless of the source of funding. Thank you, Craig. And I, and I am going to, as we, uh, as everyone goes through their introductory remarks, I am going to ask you a uh, few questions related to that mapping of maximum biological containment labs globally. I found that report very fascinating. So thank you for, for bringing that up. Um, perfect. Um, over to you, Larry. Good morning, everyone. And Sarah, thank you so much for having me. Um, first, to start with the overall question, um, in, in terms of the harmonization of the different policy uh, frameworks that are out there, Speaking on behalf of Big Pharma, um, we absolutely concur with the recommendation to merge the existing policies and definitions and agents, because it really would supply great clarity to kind of this patchwork framework that is out there. And the challenge, of course, is always going to be when the devils get into the details. So to address the, the challenge part of that, part of the RFI goes into the direction of expanding the definition of pathogens beyond the 15 to all human pathogens that have the potential to impact human health. And this is where I think it's going to get very interesting to see how some of these definitions are met. So for example, when it talks about any human, animal, or plant pathogen that is reasonably anticipated, and then goes on to use the GAO definition that is really not very helpful. Um, think about it from, you know, when, when evaluations are being done by the principal investigator level at the IRB and then at program levels at, um, I'll pick on the NIH since I was an NIH program officer there. Um, these are very, very open to a lot of bias and in interpretation. And so it is helped by the further definition that if one narrows the scope to include pathogens or toxins that require work in a BSL-3 or BSL-4. Now, it goes on to ask about what tools would be most valuable. And in particular, there's a question posed in 3D of the RFI that talks about characteristics. And while these definitions would be incredibly important, it's also that terms like likely, moderately, or highly transmissible to all pathogens, bacterial, fungal, and viral, it would help, it would be most helpful, for example, if either specific concrete examples, maybe with or without the R sub not values would be really valuable. You know, if it is going to be confined as it is in 3B to a narrow scope being a respiratory route of infection, that helps. Because otherwise, if you're looking at airborne vector, droplet, direct transmission, et cetera, and then you're asking investigators, IRBs, and program officers to think about the real epidemiological criteria of time, dose, distance, ventilation conditions, NPI protections, that gets very, very muddied. Same way with likely moderate or highly virulent without some range of where the US government is in terms of you know, high case fatality rate to low case fatality rate, to understand what's in and out of scope, the, these terms are actually very problematic. But the other thing is that if you look at what has traditionally been you know, the, the nasty nine plus X, as we refer to them, the, the pathogens of pandemic potential, only three of those are aerosol in nature. Of course, we don't know disease X. And so how does one account for the other pathogens that have at least very significantly high potential for epidemics or public health emergencies in regional contexts? Lastly, I'll just raise one element that for industry is more of a question and a lack of understanding of why recommendation five in the RFI NSCBB recommends the removal of blanket exclusions for research activities associated with surveillance and vaccine development or production for research. And I had trouble figuring out why were vaccines called out until I started making some calls and found out this is trying to solve a problem with an extremely small number of PIs that use an exemption at the NIH. And I think there are better ways to address that um, I think the major 
problem with this is that you will significantly stifle industry work, and it will be a major setback to the U.S. government's 100-day mission. It may potentially be solved by placing an exemption will be granted upon declaration of a public health emergency in the United States, because without it, it will significantly slow R&D during a response. It'll disincentivize small and medium-sized companies and investors. And honestly, it will penalize investigators in countries that place these restrictions versus countries that do not. So let me stop there and have to address questions later on. That was uh, that was wonderful. Thank you so much, Larry, and a lot lot to unpack there. So thank you so much for those uh, for those opening remarks, and I will definitely tease out some of those in today's discussion. Um, wonderful. Over to you, Andy. All right. Thank you so much, Siren. Thanks so much for inviting me. Um, it's kind of a difficult act to follow the three of you because you already raised most of the the main issues and challenges um, with trying to to implement the recommendations from NSABB and respond um, to the RFI. Um, I think I'd like to focus um, from my perspective as somebody who actually works in one of the containment labs that Greg mentioned um, in Canada. Uh, also glad to hear we we scored highly in that regard um, for Dirk. Um, but I, I think that for me, there's really two things um, in thinking about this and looking at this that that I would like to touch on. One of them is the, the really subjective nature, um, which Larry just brought up of some of uh, the recommendations. And Rajiv also brought it up that there's no real one solution. There's no one policy solution that can kind of cover every circumstance. Um, and I think that's where technical expertise is really, really important here. Um, because one experiment that might be very high risk um, with a pathogen that some would consider maybe moderately virulent, some would consider highly virulent. Um, you know, if you're inserting GFP into that, that's a gain of function technically. But that's, I think probably nobody would say that that's a very dangerous experiment because usually when you're doing this type of work, there's a trade-off. Um, and this is a, a technical and biological trade-off where if you insert a GFP that makes your virus green, um, you're taking away some of its, its virulence. Um, and that's usually what happens. And so this is where it's a very situational um, circumstance where every experiment potentially um, needs to be reviewed. And I guess that's where it starts getting really tricky for me because I think, how is this actually going to work in practice in a way that allows research to proceed unhindered, um, but is still uh, making sure that that things are undergoing a robust review for biosafety um, and uh, and certainly biosecurity too, but um, biosafety is really, I think, what we're talking about in this circumstance. Um, so I think that there needs to be some type of mechanism, and I'm not sure how to do this because I'm not a policy person as much, um, but I think there needs to be some mechanism and it may be investment into uh, whatever type of oversight is going to eventually be implemented there needs to be sufficient um, throughput and sufficient expertise to make sure this can happen efficiently. Because as, as Larry was mentioning, um, some of these terms can be a little muddy and so and they can be very subjective. So it's really important to make sure that that critical research that is going to be important to industry for manufacturing vaccines and other countermeasures um, for academics to be able to make progress and actually understanding some of these pathogens so that we can develop those countermeasures in the first place is not being uh, held back. And the other point that I'd like to make um, is transparency. The current issue, um, one of the current issues, there are many with the current P3CO framework, um, in my view, is that there's not very much transparency and there's not a good understanding even among the scientists who are trying to comply with that framework of how it is being implemented and what needs to be done. Um, there is a very opaque process currently for evaluating experiments that do fall under the P3CO. Um, and I think that there has been a lot of confusion uh, in the, the, the virology community about whether or not they need to comply with it. And part of that has to do with the funding source, of course, if you're not funded by HHS, then do you have to? No. Um, and that's 
that's definitely an oversight that needs to be addressed. Um, but at the same time, you want, I think most of my colleagues who are doing this type of work and, you know, depending on how it's defined, that's certainly not all virologists, but I think the ones who are, um, people who are working with dangerous pathogens in high containment or doing, uh, you know, enhanced um, pandemic potential pathogen research are often confused about how to actually comply with the framework. Um, you know, you report it to your program officer and then the, the process again is not very clear. So I think that that we do need to have more transparency both in, on the side of regulation as well as um, on the, the side of the investigators who are trying to comply with those regulations. And I'll stop there too, because I think we're gonna have a lot of time to discuss this and unpack it. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Andy. And I think it's really important to hear from you know practitioners like yourself to see how this would apply and what the feedback is um, and the like. So, um, so for our audience who has joined, um, if you have any questions, please feel free to put it into the chat box. And as I am posing questions to our panelists, I may also pull some questions from the chat box to, to ask them as well. So feel free to utilize the chat box to put your questions in there. I'll start my first question uh, with Rajiv, and this touches on a little bit of what Larry mentioned. So uh, Rajiv, given your extensive background in vaccine development and strategy, how do you see the relationship between the accelerated pace of vaccine research and the biosafety and biosecurity oversight provided um, you know, uh, by frameworks such as DERC and, and P3CO? And are there any challenges or synergies in ensuring rapid response to threats while maintaining stringent oversight? Well, I think that um, what what my colleagues have highlighted here, particularly um, Angie just now and and Larry, uh, is the unintended consequences of imposing ambiguous restrictions guidance on anyone conducting this kind of research. Because what what will happen in industry in the setting of ambiguity is that senior management, those that deploy capital, are going to adopt a more conservative posture. And they're less likely to fund R&D in critical areas if they believe that they're putting the company and their investors, stockholders at risk. Uh, and so it's, it is very important that we be as clear as possible in what the expectations are so that can guide compliance activities inside companies. Now, fortunately, and, and this is a kind of a 30,000 foot view on, on, on product development, the vast majority of work that's happening in companies is really not going to fall, is not going to raise concerns uh, of the nature that we're discussing here. And so it would be a shame if we put in place a framework that was insufficiently clear that stifled a lot of this, uh, is, is a, a, lot, a lot of that research. And so I do think we need to be very um, careful as we think through, as Greg pointed out, some regulations or legislation to address this issue, which we don't currently have beyond the select agent um, rule and, 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 and related rules. So I, I, I think that, uh, you know, in the setting of infectious disease product development, which is, you know, frankly, under supported by industry as it is, we have to be very careful about creating more disincentives to doing this kind of work. I do think it's fortunate that the majority of vaccine development and antiviral development does not need to involve the kind of concerning uh, the, the 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 approaches that we're most concerned about, or there are alternate ways you could you could tackle this to avoid having to go through um, this kind of review process. But I think the clarity on expectations is is critically important. Absolutely, absolutely, and and obviously um, terms matter. So defining those terms and and, and the like are, are very very important. Um, so Greg, I'm gonna go over to you. And you mentioned this in your introductory remark and you're one of the co-authors of the report Mapping Maximum Biological Containment Labs Globally, which is an effort to increase public awareness about biosafety level four or BSL-4 laboratories around the world. The report provides a map of BSL-4 laboratories that are planned under construction and in operation and identifies ways to measure the biosafety and biosecurity practices in the countries containing BSL-4 laboratories. Can you share a few high-level recommendations made in the report and how can those recommendations help shape the current discussion we're having on strengthening biosafety and biosecurity here in the United States? Sure. Um, yeah, happy to share some of the, the findings from our report. And um, people can find the, the map in the report at um, globalbiolabs.org. 
Um, and it's a, a website put together uh, in partnership with the Bulletin Atomic Scientist who, who did a, a wonderful job making it very uh, easy to navigate. Um, so our recommendations cover um, the spectrum of from, from the local lab level up to the international level. And um, you know, one of our recommendations is the adoption of what's known as um, ISO 35001, which is a um, biosafety biosecurity standard that was developed by an international group of, of experts that provides kind of a, a baseline for labs to uh, adopt that, um, you know, uh, provides guidance for how to prioritize biosafety and biosecurity throughout the entire laboratory complex from the janitors up to the, the PI and the lab director. Um, you know, labs in, in the United States and, and Canada that already are subject to, um, you know, biosafety, biosecurity regulations um, would, uh, you know, don't necessarily need that that standard because they already have these regulations. But for uh, labs and country developing countries that don't have as robust national biosafety and biosecurity legislation regulations, these standards would be incredibly useful. Um, and and so we would encourage them to be to be adopted much more um, broadly. Um, at the national level, um, what's you know really needed is um, uh, both kind of legislation regulation at the national level that is covers virus management as a whole. So it covers both biosafety, biosecurity, and dual use research oversight. And in most countries, including the United States, that oversight is very fragmented. Um, again, Canada scores very high on this regard because they have a national integrated system that covers um, labs that are both publicly funded and privately funded. Um, the, the, the Canadian model kind of, I think, is the gold standard for how to approach uh, these issues in a very kind of holistic, comprehensive um, way. And I'd like to see that the, the U.S. adopt some of those uh, uh, approaches more. And then finally, at the global level, um, there are a, a number of initiatives underway that do help build capacity for biosafety and biosecurity, um, that do um, uh, you know, uh, it help both labs and countries uh, develop here, but they're they're woefully underfunded. They're un they're they're not very well coordinated, um, and um, and they're not very kind of comprehensive. And so uh, we could have a much kind of broader impact on virus management around the world if we were kind of better fund and better coordinate these kinds of efforts and have a uh, better architecture for global bio risk management governance. Um, and um, I'm, I'm kind of skipping a lot of the details, but if you, if you read the report, um, you know, we, we go into great depth about exactly what organizations uh, need to be strengthened and, and what are some of the, the specific things we can be doing at the, the local, national, international level. Perfect. Thank you. And I'd certainly recommend reading that report. I found it very, very useful. So, so thank you for, for highlighting that. Um, so, uh, Larry, in your introductory remarks, you shared some really great insight and recommendations on gaps, challenges, and, and potentially even a couple of, uh, you know, ways forward in that sense. Um, I want to bring in also uh, kind of the intelligence and given your background in both intelligence and national security. Um, and can you speak to the role of intelligence in informing and shaping our current biosafety and biosecurity oversight, especially with respect to policies like DERC and P3CO, and, and how can the intelligence community and scientific researchers enhance their collaboration to ensure a safer bioresearch environment? Not an easy question to answer when one of the most significant challenges of the intelligence community remains a paucity not only of collection, but when you're looking at what has to be one of the most dual use um, aspects of any biological, biological, chemical, radiological, nuclear period, every single item, every single aspect is dual use in nature. And so trying to disentangle intent and motivation of the actor who is attempting to do something nefarious from the pathogen and the delivery system are very, very, very complex. And I will say that Certainly my seven years inside the community, we didn't crack the egg and we certainly tried to get programs that focused more on understanding that ability. But again, you're talking about the difference of, you know, trying to find a needle in a haystack, that one lone actor, that one molecular biologist that could go rogue to do something versus a militant group or organization versus a state program. So the difference is between, you know, domestic type versus full-scale intelligence capabilities launched at understanding nation's intent and whether or not 
the U.S. is even a, a target. Um, in some ways, it, let, it lets me, though, answer a question that Wendy posed. Hi, Wendy, in the uh, chat, which is, how does information flow from the private sector and backwards and forwards? And, and I will say that, you know, in, in looking and working with the community, and so again, I'm talking about the 30 largest manufacturers, global manufacturers in the world. The US-based manufacturers all have all of their biosafety and biosecurity procedures based on US government rules and regulations. But what many people don't realize is that particularly for biosafety, they have to go one step further and follow FDA good manufacturing practices, which are not the same as biosafety. So for example, in BMBL language and everything, you know, you never have to worry about pest monitoring. You have, don't have to really understand or monitor for, you know, how many mosquitoes get in. Are there rats in facilities? Whereas when you're manufacturing for safe and effective drugs and products, all of that is required under FDA regulations. So their practices go above and beyond. Also for biosecurity, People going into big pharma are put through incredibly rigorous background checks because the three drivers of big pharma are um, protection of intellectual property, protection of brand recognition, and protection of the, the regulatory process that gets you to safe and effective products. All companies have incredibly robust headquarters and city level integration with police, fire, and WMD coordinators. And they run drills multiple times per year on everything from breach of containment to earthquakes to loss of electricity. So there's the, already a working relationship between the local and the federal government that could facilitate questions and information exchange that does not get into the proprietary information that industry must protect. Um, oh, there was going to be one other thing. To Raji's point, I, everything he said, echo. What may surprise people is, so for example, again, speaking on behalf of the 30 global manufacturers, four work with select agents or one with high consequence pathogens of the USDA. So you are not talking about, you know, a large set. Um, and, sorry, let me stop there. No, that was, that was wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Larry. And, and uh, still a lot, obviously, to, to unpack and, and to talk about. We won't do any of these topics justice in the hour that we've allocated for today's seminar. Um, so, Angie, over to you, and certainly as a practitioner and, and a virologist, and you've mentioned the complexities of developing policy. And so given, you know, the issue and, and, and challenges of, um, and the nuances both in virology and policymaking, what steps do you believe are essential to ensure effective communication and understanding between scientists and policymakers? And how can we ensure that policies like Dirk and P3CO are both protective and supportive of the scientific community's efforts? Yeah, I think this is the real challenge because um, we can't expect policymakers to all go get PhDs in virology. And even among virologists, you know, I wouldn't necessarily be qualified to talk about dangerous experiments with plant viruses because I'm a, an animal virologist. Um, so it it's really challenging trying to communicate what can often be extremely complex and extremely technical considerations that need to be taken into context when thinking about this. Um, so I'll give you an example of where the, the, the language in the NSABB recommendations I think is going to potentially hinder this process. Um, because how do you quantify something that's moderately or highly virulent? Um, it's it's not something you can really look at a chart and say, okay, this falls in here. And to give you an example, um, let's look at Restin virus. Restin virus is a type of Ebola virus that was the subject of the book, The Hot Zone. Restin virus is BSL-4 and it's a select agent. Um, however, uh, you could make an argument not that I'm making this argument, um, but you could make an argument that Restin virus doesn't cause disease in people. Um, it kills Cinemogus macaques with a virus or a disease that looks very much like Ebola virus disease in humans, but, and humans do get infected with it, 
um, they seroconvert, but they don't really develop severe disease. Does that mean that Reston virus is considered moderately virulent? Um, you know, it's an RNA virus and it's a zoonotic virus that can jump species. So do we want to take that chance? And I don't think anybody is arguing that we should start working with Reston virus and BSL-2, but I do think it illustrates some of the challenges in this because there are species specific differences in virulence and pathogenicity. There may be species or root specific differences in transmissibility. And many of those things, unfortunately, cannot be predicted using in silico models um, or surrogate systems. Sometimes the only way we can evaluate whether a pathogen is a threat um, to humans or any other species is by actually getting that pathogen and doing the experiment. Um, and unfortunately, you know, there, there are no standards for, as Greg mentioned earlier, specifically doing field research, um, doing virus surveillance or some people call it virus hunting. I prefer to call it virus discovery because we're not really looking for viruses to put on our walls as trophies. We're trying to figure out the diversity of viruses that are out there that could potentially be zoonotic pathogens that would cause us problems. How do you make a, a one size fits all policy that policymakers who may have no prior training or, or experience working with these very, very technical, difficult scientific concepts um, how do you make something that's accessible to them and that will allow them to implement a policy that's going to be circumstance specific enough um, to to adequately address those biosafety risks or those bio risks, um, and that also is going to be broad enough that that it's it's broadly accessible to the people who need to to use it. Um, I think that that is the real challenge, and I think one of the ways that we can do this is. Um, is really by having more technical expertise at the table. Um, now, I'm not saying that only virologists should be involved in this at all. And I think there has been some unfortunate discussions where it's sort of become a, a very polarized thing that we're gonna have virologists here who just want to do gain of function research and just want to do virus stuff all the time and you know stop getting in our way with these annoying regulations. Um, and then you have people who are concerned about biosafety. But I think actually the reality is that all of our interests are very aligned um, because certainly speaking just for myself, I don't want to bring home anything I work on in the lab. Um, I don't want anything that I work on in the lab getting out in my community. Um, although I, I do work with SARS coronavirus too. And unfortunately that's already out in the community, but not for my lab. Um, I, I don't want uh, myself to be the index case of a epidemic or outbreak or pandemic that's caused from virology research. And I think that potentially by letting people sit down at the same table together, and I know NSABB has done that. I know that you do have technical expertise on NSABB. Um, I think that increasing the amount of people who have a who are technical stakeholders, as well as policymakers, as well as biosafety and biosecurity experts, and having a productive um, collaborative conversation about how we're going to implement this, including helping policymakers understand the, the key technical points in a way that's accessible to them, um, will be really fruitful in terms of being able to implement some of these recommendations. Absolutely. And that, that's always a struggle, right? It's, it's obviously making sure we're hearing from the community and then vice versa. It's, it's a two-way street. It's not just a, not just a, a one-way street in, in that sense. So thank you so much, Angie, for, for highlighting that. Um, I'm going to go over to, to you, um, Rajiv. And again, for the audience who's joined, if you have questions, please feel free to put in the chat box. I will start going through some of the questions and posing it to our panelists in a moment. Um, so Rajiv, considering the global nature of pandemics and the interconnectedness of research communities worldwide, how important is international collaboration in shaping and implementing biosecurity oversight? And can you shed light on any global best practices or initiatives that might inform or complement U.S. policies like DERC and P3CO and the like? Sure. I mean, clearly, uh, you you can't restrict your um, your efforts in the space to any uh, specific country. I mean, this this has to be a global effort, and ideally, there's some consistency in how it's approached in in different places. 
uh, because as, as many people said, a, a threat anywhere is potentially a threat everywhere. And the WHO has taken on uh, this, this task and established uh, committees to, to, to look at this. Now, um, those processes can be um, ponderous and uh, can, can have uh, challenges in terms of getting alignment across 190 plus um, member states. Um, but I, I, I do think it's one of the few areas where you can have this, this uh, type of discussion that cuts across um, countries and, and uh, uh, scientific capabilities and infrastructure and, and, and so on. So that's the, and, and you can easily find, uh, find this, the, the, their latest report if you, if you, if you look online. I, I, I do want to make a, just a, a quick comment on the point Angie just, just made. Um, which is around the importance of having the right expertise involved. I completely agree with that. I also want to um, point out that particularly in this post-COVID-19, and when I say post, I mean post the emergence of SARS-CoV-2, in this environment, it's very important that we have structures that give the public confidence that it's not just the scientific experts that are providing this oversight. Because in, historically, whenever you have technical issues where the experts say, leave us alone, we've got it covered. Um, the public and policymakers lose confidence and, and, and they, they, they will have concerns. They, people need to know that there is diverse, some level of diverse representation. And by that, I mean, different backgrounds, expertise uh, being brought to bear on the question. This is a lesson I learned from Ken Bernard when he was the president's advisor on biodefense, uh, Larry and I work, both work for, for Ken and he's on the NSABB now. But he said that he told me, taught me that, that health experts have this tendency to tell non-health people that we've got it covered. And, and I think we have to be really cognizant of that and go out of our way to make sure that we put in place structures and expertise that, um, that will give the public confidence that it's not just the experts that are making all these decisions and recommendations. Yeah, absolutely. And Raji, if you don't mind spending a moment, just um, there's a question in the Q&A is asking about um, transparency, if you could unpack transparency in terms of boundaries and scope. Um, and then it goes on to say transparency to some means disclosing the names of actual review committee members. Would you include this level of transparency in your call for, for transparency? And if not, how would you set these boundaries? Well, I, you know, when I when I mentioned transparency, what I was referring to is transparency on the research that is being conducted. Uh, there should be no hesitation amongst investigators and those that institutions, including companies, that if necessary, the types of experiments could be shared with the uh, with appropriate authorities and and even made public if questions are asked. Now, obviously. This needs to be done in a way that that protects intellectual property and and uh, industry uh, uh, company confidential information. But um, my point in saying that is, you know, it needs to pass the the Washington Post test, as as we say. That if your experiment was on the front page of the Washington Post, would an informed audience, an audience that understands, you know, something about science and and experimentation and management of risk in a scientific context. Would they agree that you've appropriately um, explored alternatives and that you are appropriately conducting and providing oversight of this work? And if the answer is no, then that should give you pause. And so that that's what I mean by trans trans transparency. With, with regard to you know publishing names of of individuals on review committees, I look. I, I think at the end of the day, this information is almost always accessible um, through appropriate channels of of capturing the information. The the one troubling development over the past few years is that there uh, there have been attacks on on people that are part of uh, such committees. And I think we we need to be mindful of that and then um, protect individuals who are devoting their time to these efforts in the interest of protecting the public's health. I mean, these are people that are on these committees have, you know, in my experience, they have the right intentions and to to expose them to this kind of risk, I think, we, I just think we have to be very thoughtful about that. Absolutely. Sarah, can I comment on that? Um, I, I completely agree with you, Rajiv. And when I um, am saying transparency, you know, I've struggled myself with um, the idea that transparency is just going to be publishing the names of people so that everybody can see like who's doing the reviews. Um, because you're right. Um, and people not on those committees, I mean, I have been targeted uh, many times just because I'm outspoken on this topic. 
um, it is a it is a real threat. And there are issues as well that have to do with biosecurity, um, where you can never be completely transparent about certain operational aspects um, of your containment facility um, as well. Like I can't, you know, I would get fired if I tweeted like what my entry and exit procedures are from our CL3 um, because keeping that um, secret is one of the ways that we maintain the integrity of our, our pathogen stocks um, and one of the ways that we maintain containment. So um, I think that it's really challenging because you're trying to thread that needle between being transparent and yes, like the public should be able to look at your research, have enough of, you should be able to communicate it well enough that they can understand actually what the risks are. Um, and, you know, your average educated person would be able to, to look at that and say, whoa, like this is bad news or this is not bad news. This seems very reasonable. Um, I think that's one of the real challenges though. Like it's how do you maintain transparency about what you're doing, make sure that you're reporting adequately, make sure the public has access to that and can evaluate how things are going um, versus you know needing to maintain a certain level of security, either for the people who are doing the regulating, the scientists who are doing the work, um, and of course, maintaining the, the security of those facilities that the work is being done in. It's, it's really challenging and I'm not sure that I have an answer for it. In fact, that's why you're right, we do need a lot of diverse voices at the table, including policy experts, because virologists like me aren't necessarily going to be able to provide the best suggestion for addressing that. Thank you so much, Angie, for, for shedding some additional light on that. That's, that's great and really, really important points. Um, Greg, you know, given your, your background uh, in, in a lot of research, biosafety and biosecurity, um, how would you say the United States oversight policies, um, particularly obviously as we're talking about Dirk and, and P3CO, have evolved in response to both scientific advancements and emerging threats over the past decade? And, and as we do look ahead, and you mentioned this, you know, in your introductory remarks with obviously the changes um, uh, and, and innovation that's that's come about, AI and the like, um, how might we anticipate, you know, the current trajectory of biotechnology, biotechnological um, uh, advancements? So, I mean, up until now, the U.S. approach to, you know, oversight of research has been very reactive. Um, NSABB actually put forward a proposal for um, oversight of Dewey's research back in 2009, very comprehensive proposal that was basically ignored for several years um, until you had these very high profile experiments done with H5N1 that made these viruses transmissible for, it, among mammals. And after that, then the U.S. government adopted a, a version of that NCB proposal. Um, what NCBB is proposing now is actually very similar to what they proposed back in 2009. And so it's taken us 14 years to kind of get back to um, this um, uh, proposal for having a, a kind of more of a, uh, a national approach that does not, uh, that provides oversight regardless of the source of funding for the research, covers a much broader swath of pathogens, um, not just the, um, you know, the, was it the, the 12 or 13 agents that are, that are currently listed. Um, so, you know, the U.S. policy, I think, has been kind of lagging behind quite, quite a bit. Um, and it's even um, the, the focus on pathogens is becoming um, overtaken by advances in, in biotechnology life sciences, right? You now have uh, viral vectors, gene therapy, genome editing, which creates risks that have nothing to do with pathogenic microorganisms. Um, and that's not really even on the table in this latest round of NSCBB recommendations, um, let alone the um, the potential for kind of AI enabled um, biology design tools to to change the nature of the risks we're facing. So um, I, I think there is a an unfortunately just a fundamental kind of law of nature that the the science and technology are advancing much farther and faster than the policy is, and and so we're still playing playing catch up there. I think it's still important to, to be, you know, doing this and putting the reforms. Um, but what I would like to see is a more systematic approach. So, for example, uh, instead of just kind of patching the current policies and, and plugging some holes, actually creating uh, a, an, an independent technical agency whose job would be to oversee biosafety, bioscreen, and do and do these research oversight, which would have the ability to constantly assess these emerging technologies 
understand to what extent are there new safety and security concerns, and then start the process of engaging with the stakeholders, including the virologists and the AI folks and the, the policy community to figure out, okay, what is what are the benefits of the technology? What are the risks? And what are the measures we can put in place that are either voluntary or regulatory that would help um, you know, find the, the proper balance between um, uh, you know, maximizing the benefits and minimizing the risks? So um, I think that kind of more uh, proactive approach would would serve the U.S. much uh, much better moving forward. But unfortunately, we're not we're not there yet. We're still in this very reactive mode. Absolutely, we could say the same thing about pandemic preparedness and and response and the like. Um, so, really great point. Thank you, Greg. Um, Larry, I'm gonna I'm gonna pose a question uh, from from the chat box. So Gigi um, has asked uh, working. A work that currently undergoes EPP Dirk review has already been reviewed for safety and scientific merit. With that in mind, what specifically do you think is a purpose of review as we look towards uh, a new oversight framework? Yeah, and uh, thank you, Gigi. It's actually a very thoughtful question because I guess when I was when I read your question, I'm thinking about you know what is the next step. I, I will I will agree that you know we have an imperfect system, but in the in the past twenty years, we've evolved tremendously in terms of even our working language and lexicon from the principal investigator all the way through IRBs to the federal level on biosecurity and biosafety. To amplify something that Rajiv said, even at the global level, you now have ministers of health that will actually use the word biosecurity in a context in which it is the same lexicon we use it in the United States. So, you know, the way I'm thinking of it, this is the next stage in evolution. And that is, if the security community combined with the public health community and others believe that it is critical to evolve policy, I'm not gonna go down the, the route of regulation, um, that I think this dialogue is the first part because you're going to have the individuals who understand their research better than anyone else in the world, the principal investigators, who are really the end users of these policies that are gonna to have to understand what is your concern? What is the problem you're trying to solve? Help us with the tools to be able to assess our work. And then what does it mean for their long-term project design? So for example, I. I was privy to examples where a, and a, a proposal would come in for review. It proposed animal experiments. Investigate, um, uh, reviewers would go back to the investigator and say, is it possible to do this another way? It took them a while to come back with an answer and said, yeah, this could actually be done first, not using this animal model and try to see whether or not they needed to go to an animal model. So there's a dialogue that occurs and it's the necessity of that back and forth. If the desire is to move beyond the 15 set pathogens right now to a larger set, then understanding what are the parameters and scope of that set and why is critically important. So. I, I take your question as more of that, yes, we have the processes in place now, but the desire to evolve those to a more sophisticated set or a larger potential risk um, set, I'm trying to avoid the word list, um, is critical. Just a very quick side note. I worked for Senators Kennedy and Hatch in 1998 when the Select Agent Program was being designed. None of the programs that now exist in regulation were ever thought about that. The concept of what was, you know, the threat at the time is not what is in place now. So to the question that asked whether there should be a single agency, be careful what you ask for. <laughs> well, Rajiv and I both lived through the birth of Department of Homeland Security, Office of National Inte Director of National Intelligence, and now ARPA-H. You are not asking for something small when you create an agency of the federal government. So, so. yeah, that, that actually was going to be my follow up for both you and, and Rajiv. You know, there are numerous stakeholders and, and health agencies to national security apparatus and so many different collaborations happening at the US level. So, do you think that a single agency obviously um, would be a good, good model? Anything you want to add to that, Rajiv? 
I mean, I, I want to acknowledge that there's more expertise and thoughtfulness on, on you know, that's current than, than I on this issue. But I, I think that that Larry makes a, a very good point about the unintended consequences. And another I would add to the list is if you create a, an agency or even an office <clears throat> that has this responsibility, there is a risk that you need to manage, which is that the rest of the enterprise thinks that this problem is covered and they don't need to worry about it. And you know, in this area, it's really important for there to be a, a, a mindset, culture, and understanding across the entire research enterprise. And this is not a reason to, to, to not appoint an office, but I think it needs you need to make sure that you don't have that outcome. Um, but I, I, I do think that having a part of the government where there's greater focus uh, on, on this uh, and, it's, and, and that is accountable for doing ensuring that that happens across all the federal departments and agencies where research is being conducted, funded, or otherwise supported, I think that could be very helpful to to address some of the, the gaps that have been been highlighted here. I, I would say maybe an office, not necessarily an agency. But I think that's very interesting, right? The difference between an office and an agency um, in, that, in, that, in that sense, but I'd love to, love to think about those. So thank you for that additional uh, context, Rajiv. Um, so Angie, turning um, over to you, you know, from a virologist's perspective, how well do you believe the current U.S. oversight policies align with the dynamic and evolving nature of viral research? And are there any specific areas within these policies where you see there is a need for greater alignments with the realities and advancements of virology? Well, I mean, if we're, we're talking about the current policies that are implemented right now. That's the P3CO. And um, there's definitely gaps in that policy, as I said earlier I think there's a lot of confusion about how to actually comply with it. And some of that has to do with the definitions of um, what makes an enhanced pandemic potential pathogen. Um, what is reasonable anticipation that something's going to be more transmissible or pathogenic in a human? You, It's hard to say what is reasonable about that because a different person would anticipate that risk differently if the experiment's never been done. And obviously there are no virologists um, that I know of who are advocating for doing you know, human challenge experiments to determine if something actually is uh, more transmissible or pathogenic in people or not. Um, so I think that, that the definitions um, right now make it very, very challenging for virologists to say, well, you know, I'm gonna mouse adapt this novel bat coronavirus that I got. Um, I want to see if it causes disease in a mouse model. Is that making an EPPP? Um, it, you know, you asked probably four of us here, we might come up with four different answers about that. Um, and I think that that makes it very, very challenging to comply with. Now, I do think here in Canada, um, as Greg mentioned, we do regulate this work at the federal level. Um, which does make it somewhat easier. Um, we still, though, do have the same structure of institutional biosafety committees and institutional oversight as well. Um, I think that having a federal oversight office agency, that's not the question for me, but I think that it would make things a little bit more clear because there would be a resource for virologists to, to turn to in making sure that we can actually comply with that. Um, because again, I don't think, I don't think in general people are trying to avoid compliance. Um, certainly we don't want there to be so much red tape that we can't get anything done, but we already do a lot of paperwork to, to handle biosafety, ethical animal use, ethical um, studies with human participants, things like that. You know, it's it's not that we are opposed to regulation. Um, I think that that regulation, though, needs to be applied thoughtfully in a way that that is unambiguous, at least in terms of what you would need to do to comply with it. We have the tools that we need to make sure that that we are participating and engaged in that oversight process. Um, I know we're we're at time right now, so I'm just going to wrap up. But I think that the last thing I'd like to say about that is that if there is going to be a federal authority that is going to provide that oversight, there needs to be adequate investment in that, just as there is for research. So I know, Syra, we've talked in the past about how the boom and bust cycle of research funding has made pandemic pre prevention very difficult um, and pandemic response is very difficult because if you're always waiting for the next sort of boom, 
you're not able to get prepared during those bust times in between. And the same thing I think applies for this. If you're gonna have federal oversight, you have to make sure that there's adequate investment to make sure that that office or agency um, is equipped to actually provide this oversight and to provide the tools that, that scientists will need in order to comply with it. Um, and that means technical expertise, policy expertise, regulatory expertise. Um, and that's not going to be cheap, um, especially if we're expanding from a list to potentially any pathogen that that might be used in research of concern. Um, so I would I would say that I'm OK with that idea. I think it's a, a good way to to um, standardize things across the board and to create a culture of uh, of increased biosafety and biosecurity. But I do think that it could be disastrous if it's not funded properly and if it's not, if the, the amount of effort that is needed to effectively implement this is not contributed to it. Absolutely. So thank you so much, Angie, for those remarks. Um, so as we conclude today's seminar, I do want to give each of our panelists an opportunity briefly to just share anything that they'd like to part with for with our audience. And so in you know, biosecurity and, and, and biosafety, there's a very delicate balance between promoting innovative research and ensuring security to prevent misuse and ensuring stringent biosafety and biosecurity measures um, are in place. We live in a world with a very rapid pace of technological advancements in life sciences. And obviously we all see um, emerging threats and challenges in the next decade and, and so on. So in your concluding remarks and briefly, if you wanna share anything that you wanna highlight about that or just um, anything to close up your, your thoughts and we'll start with Rajiv and, and go around briefly. Well, you know, this this is an ever present uh, threat and risk that we're we're discussing today. I think today's discussion highlights the uh, the complexity and um, the a, a lot about the unintended consequences of of uh, potential restrictions on how research and oversight of how research is um, is is conducted. Um, I, I I do think that um, the 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 need for a robust response capability is is the one thing that you uh, you can't make a you, you you're not going to make a mistake in investing in public health capacity and surveillance and generic response capabilities you know the ability to deploy masks the understanding of the population of how to distance um, at a uh, in, in the setting of a, a novel respiratory pathogen and we we all have the collective benefit of having gone through this and i would say that you know covid-19 was practice um, the reality is that we could in the future face a pathogen that is much more virulent, much more transmissible than what we saw with COVID-19. Of course, you know, many in the public there may not realize that. And I think it's up to policymakers to keep that in, 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 in mind and, and make these generic investments um, that will help us no matter what threat we face in the future. Thank you, Raji. Greg? Uh, well, I'm I'm glad that that Angie and Rajiv uh, agree that we do need a more kind of concentrated um, national approach to to virus management. And if it's an agency and office, I'm I'm, I'm flexible. But uh, having uh, kind of a more coordinated, uniform approach, I think, would be great. And I totally agree that uh, it needs to be done with investment. This cannot be an unfunded mandate on PIs and research institutions because then you'll um, you know you will not be achieving the objectives you're you're looking for. So I think that's definitely a, a key prerequisite. But you know, this is a recognition, this is a wicked problem. We're never going to solve it. We can just manage it. Uh, but managing it properly requires having you know, interdisciplinary conversations like this one, where we have people with both the technical background, the government experience, the policy experience, who can try and you know, navigate the challenges posed by um, the need to you know, enhance biosafety and biosecurity, but at the same time, not stifle the innovation that we all you know, recognize is, is even more important in the era of COVID and disease acts and, and whatever comes comes next. So, um, you know, I think this is a, a great uh, part contribution to that process of having the conversation among the different types of stakeholders that need to be involved. Um, I think OSTP issuing the request for information is a great step because they will uh, definitely be able to get a lot of input from a variety of, of stakeholders. Um, and whatever comes out of that, uh, again, has to be looked at as, um, you know, the next step in the evolution, but not the final step. And we need to be constantly thinking about what comes next, because we're already seeing challenges related to, you know, to AI, 
uh, genome editing, synthetic biology, which won't be captured by even what NSABB is is been recommending. So this is going to be an ongoing challenge that we need kind of constant attention to, and we need the engagement of all these communities in a productive, constructive way. And I think this is today's webinar is a great example of that, and I look forward to, to more of them. Thanks. Greg, we appreciate your thoughts. Larry? Thanks, Aaron. Thank, thanks for having me. I, you know, I'm going to make just a small pitch, and that is when you think about the entire R&D ecosystem and the impact of these type of critical pieces of policy and legislation, um, I will say just having lived on this side of the world for 18 months now, it's really, really critical that the small, medium, and large biopharmaceutical industries are included in the conversation. And what I found is that they're talked about a lot, but they don't really talk to us very much. And there are so many, what I found to be really just like standard operating procedures and the way in which industry does risk assessments all the time, where the government could learn so much. Again, it doesn't get into the product. It doesn't get into the proprietary information, but it's just the way they do things for different drivers, but they're there. And so having these conversations is really important. I do applaud OSTP for getting the RFI out, but even leading up to that, you know, it would be good to have the dialogue versus you know, just submitting written comments. So the more that the dialogue can include all stakeholders, as Greg said, I, I strongly would advocate for that. Thanks. Absolutely. It's that, that two-way communication. We, we fundled and, and tripped over that during the pandemic, and we've certainly seen the importance of communication on an ongoing basis. So thank you so much, Larry. Um, Angie, your thoughts? I'm just going to keep it very brief and say that I just completely agree with all of that. Um, too often, uh, a lot of these conversations um, that I've been in, I've sat on way too many panels where it becomes virologists versus the world. Um, and I, I really don't think that's very productive um, because I actually think that our interests um, across stakeholders, even at this panel, are very aligned. Um, and we're, I think we, we are in agreement more than we're not. Um, so I think this this panel was wonderful and very rewarding in the sense that I think it it showed an example of the types of conversations I'd like to see where we can have a discussion where everybody is bringing in their own perspective and their own expertise and it's being appreciated and considered thoughtfully and we're we're all moving towards the the same goal um, which I do think we are I think that this type of engagement across um, different fields is going to be critical for, for implementing any kind of regulation effectively. Um, and I'm grateful for the opportunity and grateful to have this panel. And I also look forward to, to many more of these conversations. Thank you so much, Andy. So with that, Rajiv, Greg, Larry, Andy, thank you for joining today's seminar. It was a really great discussion. We look forward to ongoing thoughts. This is certainly just like the tip of the iceberg. There's so much more to unpack that we didn't have an opportunity to do so. But with that, Thank you all so much for joining and thank you to the audience for joining as well. Um, for some of the links uh, and reports that were shared, uh, we'll see if we can send that out to folks that have, that have been asking for it. Uh, so with that, I'd like to also thank the Harbor Belfer Center for hosting today's seminar. Thank you all so much for joining and enjoy the rest of your day.